For those who have been in administration for some time, the logical question is, what is next in my leadership journey? My guest today, Brian Zwemke, shares how he was a building principal and got an opportunity to move up as the assistant superintendent of learning and innovation in a district in Illinois. And he talks through not only his experience as a administrator, but in his new position as he gets to help his new school district in many facets. In our conversation today, Brian talks through the challenges of starting a new position in the district office, but then also what support is needed to be successful in that new role. We also talk about mentorship, soft skills for students, sharing our narrative as an educational system, and the importance of building a network of leaders to grow in our leadership skills. Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire to Lead, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. Aspire listeners, you are in trouble because I have an amazing leader on with me today. Brian, how are you doing today? Good, Josh. How are you doing? I'm awesome now. I get to not only hang out with you on Tuesday mornings, but now on an evening. I, I My cup is filled. That's good. That's good. What's in your cup? What's in your cup these days? <laughs> I don't think I can tell the listeners what's in my... No, I'm kidding. I've got hot tea right now. Typically, when you see me, I have a large cup of coffee. Sure. You know, I will double up on coffee. I actually just had a cup. So you got me, you got me caffeinated. You got me excited. <laughs> We're going to have some fun. I love it. Buddy, let's talk about Tuesday mornings because me and you get to co-host, co-facilitate some amazing conversations with leaders across the country in our mastermind. You've been doing it actually a lot longer than I, and I would love your perspective on what that program is all about. Yeah. You know, it's, it's probably out of a lot of things I get to do it's one of the things that I look for the most to do. And, uh, you know, hosting, co-hosting Administrator Mastermind with you and with uh, Brad Hughes previously and the the family of, of, of the Teach Better team, that's, that's really been great to me. You know, quite frankly, I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in right now without the help and the support of, of a great professional learning network. And that one is absolutely top notch, as you well know. You know, it's a chance every week to get together with with your colleagues with your friends and talk shop and put your problems out there and be vulnerable and ask for advice and and get excited and you know it, it's also the opportunity that I feel like I get to give back a little what I've been able to take from my mentors and my predecessors that have you know always been good listeners and can can allow you to you know take some time to to vent and allow you to take some time to grow and and make mistakes. And, and I just feel like that's the, among the many things I get to do to contribute to education. And I, and I say get to rather than have to, because it's a privilege ultimately to, to work in public education and, and do the work we do. Um, that's so meaningful to me. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've had, you know, a couple different jobs and, you know, gone through a doctoral program while I've been a part of that. Uh, mastermind as as a participant and now you know fortunately as a host and and uh, or co-host and uh, you know everybody's been carrying me you do a great job with that and I just I just love it I love it I think it's probably the one of the most important things that we do is we recognize that we need each other yep. uh, to lean on and and uh, you know I'm just privileged to be a part of it well I'm privileged to co-facilitate with you and I do not carry it by any means. You are 100% part of that uh, <laughs> journey with me. So um, I love doing that program. And for anyone that's looking to connect with other leaders, obviously, this is a free mastermind that we provide as a Teach Better team. So if you are interested in signing up, it is no cost. Teachbetter.com slash mastermind. If you want to go on, sign up real quick. You get a link every week just as a reminder um, so that you know to join the group and yeah, I just, I look forward to that every week, not only to see Brian, but then also the other fantastic leaders. So Brian, you mentioned a little bit about you and what you've gone through the, the last couple of years, but I want to get the 500,000 view <laughs> lens of, of what's going on in your world. So if you wouldn't mind, will you just share with listeners your leadership and educational journey? Sure. This is year 22, 23 for me. I, um, graduated in December of 99. 
um, and got into education. I had no idea that I wanted to be an educator. I, I went to college and, and I thought that I wanted to be a journalist, actually. So along that path, uh, we had to do some community work. And I found myself at a junior high in um, the Western Illinois region of, of the state. I was helping out the the kids with a newspaper and I was like, okay, I love this. You know, I was far enough along into my program where, you know, I can make a change. And I said, I really want to be a teacher. And and I really loved the kids. Uh, that was the first draw. Middle school kids were the first draw. And, you know, I took some history classes and English classes and I decided to be a teacher. As I taught, I taught for six years and then I moved into administration and served in a variety of roles there. Um, as a teacher, I taught English and, and um, social studies, and I loved it. Coached everything that they let me. Coached things that I didn't even want to, that they were like, hey, you're coaching. And I was like, okay. Uh, it's kind of a little part of, of starting off. Um, yep. I will tell you, uh, I don't know, did you coach any sports? Yeah, I had football, basketball, and track. Did you coach any sports that you probably shouldn't have? Yes, 100%. Football, basketball, and track. No, yeah. I, actually, I was a soccer player for 20 years, and that's actually what I first started coaching in Minnesota, but then I moved to Texas, and Texas is so different <laughs> with how they, do, how they work with coaches, and so I got three sports that you know I knew some of, but I probably wasn't the expert in those three sports. I, I played basketball and baseball, and, and, uh, but uh, I had to coach football. And I was like, legit, like, I don't know what I'm doing. They're like, just go out there and condition with the kids. And then like, lo and behold, like a, like a year or so later, like I was like the head coach of the thing and it was brutal. And uh, I was like learning plays on Madden. I was like getting, getting penalties, like just for lack of formation or whatever. And they would throw the penalty flag. And um, so I like said to the referee, like after the third time, I'm like, dude, your arm's going to fall off and you're going to, you know, like <laughs> we're going to keep doing this. And I like burned like two timeouts. I'm like, teach my kids, teach me. I don't know what I'm doing. So anyway, so after, after uh, teaching, I jumped into administration uh, after getting my master's and I was the first, I was actually the first Dean of students in that school. They hadn't had one before. So I got to kind of create that position. It's not like, you know, it was, it was brand new concept. People knew what deans were, but it was new there. And then once you once you go into administration, you start to recognize around you that that you're you're making a difference, and then on certain days you're not. And then you know you you learn a lot from the people above you, certainly, and you learn about the people around you, and you learn how to work on a team. And then other opportunities present themselves. So I was able to go kind of on the student services side of things as an assistant principal and just kind of, you know, did, was was among the fir first people to do the RTI game, which is, you know, certainly now MTSS. Got to serve in the athletic director role for, for a bit. Um, and then I had my op first opportunity to be a middle school principal. Served as a middle school principal in, in two different districts and then uh, as a high school principal as well. And then uh, currently now I have taken the leap to district office and now I'm serving as an assistant superintendent for learning and innovation, focusing in on middle school and high school curriculum and instruction. And I love it. Um, I've learned and loved all of the, my previous roles and where I'm at right now, I got a great team. Um, I'm being challenged, um, which is great. Really enjoying it. Brian, I want to touch on that because I have a lot of administrators that come to me you know, talking about their journey and how they're on a campus building level as a principal, as a cis principal, and then, hey, I'm thinking about going to the district office. And right. it's just like, am I going to like it? I'm not with kids. What goes on in the district office? There's a lot of questions there. For you, going from the building level now to the district office, I know you said that you love it, but I'm just curious on the differences and, you know, why is it that you have enjoyed the move up into your new position. Yeah, it, it's only been, you know, three, four months now. So, you know, I'm, I'm literally learning and growing differently every day. And I don't view it as I'm moving up. Like I don't view it as like a hierarchy, like that, that I'm up. I view it at kind of in a flattened model where you put students in the middle of that. And then, you know, with your, with your concentric circles, you're, you're, you're supporting learning, but you're doing it from a different way. So <clears throat> you're really thinking about like, kind of the entire ecosystem and, and leading through people differently than being right there every single day. And, 
my goal really is to be in the buildings, you know, 40, 50% of the time. I've been really intentional about being in buildings, you know, through a number of activities that I've, I've participated in already. Even more so, like to me right now, spending time in buildings is, is more important to me than going to a conference. You know, the more I get to know people, you know, it's, it's what we've all learned along our leadership journey, but putting those things into play building relationships, understanding what the root cause of, of the issue might be, asking good questions, cultivating you know ideas with other people. It's really given me a chance to analyze and think about issues from from a different lens. And and you know, I am on a team of cleanup hitters. Like everybody is unbelievably gifted. You know, you provide your value. You learn a lot every day. I've been in more webinars and I've I've read more articles. Um, as, a, as a building principal, you're thinking strategically and you should about your school improvement plan and strategic plan, but you kind of don't really know all of that until you get to be a part of that. Doing it from a district lens right now is is it's really rewarding. You know, you get you get to certainly get to, you know, do that coaching side of things at the at the building level. But you're you're really responsible for the teaching and learning, and that's a that's a big it's a big lift, and and uh, I'm I'm really enjoying it so far. Thinking about it from a from a different lens and as a building leader. Yeah, Brian, and I really enjoy your perspective in the mastermind because a lot of times you're talking through things from your new position, which is like you said, the strategic planning piece, but then also policies. And sure. A lot of times, I think on the camp level that gets lost just because of how busy things are and you're trying to problem solve in the moment. And I love your perspective a lot of times with the different resources that you provide within the mastermind. But I want to talk through some of that policy piece. So, you know, what are you doing with policy to support decision making at a district level? I think sometimes when there's a, an issue or you're thinking about doing something new, or even refining something that you know has been successful for a, for a long time. Uh, what I found at the building level is is you immediately go right to the problem solving. You know, you get into the logistics and you're you know you're starting the Google Doc up and here comes the table and the chart and this person's going to do this and this person's going to be doing that. And I think from from a policy standpoint is the issues or the problems that we're trying to solve are not new problems. We've just had the newest problem we've ever had over the last, you know, two years. And, and and outside of that, the issues that we have, they're really not new problems. We're trying to close the gap on academic achievement. We're trying to focus in on tier one, like really like getting down and dirty into what we're trying to do and what we're trying to focus on. So when we look at our curricular review, when we look at our policies, when we look at our organizational structures, it really helps to go back to what those policies are through your 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 board policy and think about it from that perspective rather than this is what I need to do two days from now, four days from now, six days from now. And I, I worked with a previous superintendent who was really good about just creating a cycle of policy um, review for himself. And, and, you know, I've taken that with me into, you know, my new position where it helps me not just ask a question that like, I need to know something, you know, maybe right now to help me understand something for a meeting later, you know, that week or, or, or into the future, but also just thinking about where have we been and what's the policy? And then what are those administrative procedures that we have that can support our policy? As far as your role now, obviously you are at the district level, and I know, you know, as an administrator myself, I love getting a chance to build other leaders. So I'm curious on like what your role is in your new position and are you able to coach teachers? Are you able to coach administrators? And if so, what does that program look like? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's two way. I'm learning a lot from our building level leaders and our district leaders. Probably, you know, right now I, I'm probably... I'm probably taking a little bit more than, than I'm even giving, to be honest, you know, just, just in the sense of being, you know, new to a district, being new to a new district um, and being in a, in, in a new role. I have some great mentors right now, but the, the thing that, you know, I, I enjoy and I can, I can take some, some solace in is, you know, I have been there at, at the building level as a, as a middle school principal and a high school principal. So I know what that walk looks like. I know what, what, 
that feels like on a, on a daily basis. And when I, when I first got into administration, I worked with a, a, a principal who talked about the further you move up in the organization, you're, you're going to move away from kids. You're going to move away from teachers and you have to be cognizant of that. And uh, it's always been very important to me to stay really focused in on, on the, the work. And while I'm not supporting the day-to-day work in, in a particular building, you know, I, I am, you know, still focused on what are we trying to do? And what we're trying to do is help our students grow, you know, academically and social emotionally every day. And from a different lens, I get to do that now. So you mentioned mentorship and I know my listeners understand where I stand with mentorship. I'm a huge proponent of it, but can you just speak about the ways that mentorship has touched you as a leader? Yeah, I've always I've always been blessed that the the folks that that have taken an opportunity to bring me under their wing, have taken their time with me, have helped me learn and grow and 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 allow me to take some, you know, calculator risks and fail a little bit and you know do those types of things and and I really think one of the best gifts that I've ever really received is some great thought partners. And it wasn't somebody to say, Hey, Josh, I'm thinking about this. Should I do that? The the best leaders that I work with now and the best leaders I ever worked with never really said directly, do this or do that, but they lead you down a road like a great teacher does down a road of inquiry where it allows you to think it allows you to look at things from you know multiple angles, from a political frame, from a symbolic frame. What would this do to us economically? What would this do to us strategically? And and you know the the best the best teachers, the best department chairs, instructional coaches, um, they have a gear that they're always calm. And what what I've really enjoyed is working with you know incredible educators from a variety of roles, because I don't think you have to have a title to be a leader, but just taking that calm approach and thinking, okay, what are we trying to solve here? How can we work together on this? What are your thoughts? All right, let's try to do some things together, but not, you know, necessarily somebody saying yes or no. And and I try to do that in the same way that uh, when, when people are coming to me is what's the question behind the question that, that you're asking, what are we trying to get towards? And if we solve this, you know, right now, um, what are we going to get out of it? And if we 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 think, what can we what can we do a little bit better long term? This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter dot com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. You had mentioned that you get an opportunity to to jump into schools and classrooms and see all the mm-hmm. amazing things that's occurring every single day but unfortunately not everybody gets to see that especially the community right so i know you know for yourself you've taken more of a a stance of like trying to make sure that a school is represented or at least your school your district is represented on social media but i want to know why you think it's important for us to control the narrative about what's going on within our building i think we have a humble profession i i think we uh allow uh, the narrative to get told for us uh, rather than 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 telling it, and and you know there's a there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, you know the the education profession I think unfairly gets beat up. I think public education unfairly gets beat up. What we try to do every day is is heroic. I mean, we take kids from from all walks of life, from from all over uh, the country, all over the world, and and we try to engage with them. And help them grow academically and help them grow social emotionally. I mean, that's amazing. And I think that's a story that we need to tell. And I think, you know, kids, you know, aren't always the best about telling, you know, mom and dad and, and the community about what's going on. You know, how was school? It was fine. What'd you do? Nothing. And I and I think we we can do a lot better than that. And I think school districts and, and not mine really in particular, but you know, a part of my dissertation and research, you know, a, a few years back was I was looking at really, really good schools. And I said, well, you know, let me analyze their social media and see what they talk about. And essentially, even the best schools by the metrics on on state report cards and, and so on and so forth, essentially just said, this is when school is, and this is when school is not. No school, parent-teacher conferences, uh, first day of school, August 16th, school closed, winter break. And they would, you know, I get it. Like you have to, it's the stuff that goes on, on, on the fridge, 
In addition to that, they talked about what happened after school, the, the football team won or when baseball tryouts are or, you know, come celebrate the kids in, in the musical. And that's great to talk about Susical and musical. But at the end of the day, like what just happened here from eight to three every day? Seriously, like our teachers are putting a ton of time, energy and effort into their lessons. They are working to know their learners. We are working to help our, our learners know themselves you know, through, through inventories and, and on that college and career path. But yet from eight to three, we don't talk very much about what we do. And, um, I, you know, I think that's, I think that's kind of a, a, a critical error that we should be talking about what's happening, uh, in our classroom. And I think, you know, if you, if you don't have information that goes out on a consistent basis, it, it, you know, there's times where people make up their own narrative for sure. But it, it, to me, it's just a miss. On social media, uh, you know, I kind of believe that like words are nice, pictures are better, video is the best. And then, uh, you know, quite frankly, opportunities for authentic two-way dialogue with with community and family are are, are even better. And, you know, we, we see that model out in a number of ways as well, too. But, you know, if you have, if you have uh, a, a classroom teacher doing, you know, some sort of awesome demonstration with kids or um, you see them working and collaborating together, all the soft skills that we're looking for uh, in, in, in our, you know, our community and throughout our country, like we got to show that so that, you know, people are proud of the work that we're doing. And, you know, it, it's a real passion to me to, to make sure that not only are we, um, you know, making our website look good, but also that we're telling our story on social media. And there's, there's really kind of two big camps on that. Number one is, you know, social media works for you. You control your all your your own algorithm. You determine what you see, what you don't see. And if you don't want to hear from somebody, mute them. You know, if you if you don't want to engage in a conversation, don't. But that kind of fear factor, I I think most people have gotten past that uh, in in education. But it's a huge opportunity um, to help tell the story about what's happening. You know, it, from a PE class to a CTE class to social emotional growth, it's it's a game changer. So we talked about some of the projects that you've been doing within your campus. We talked about the administrative mastermind, but I want to know what else you've been up to. And I know you always have wonderful ideas for your district. And I just want to know what's going on in your world as far as projects. Yeah, I think probably, you know, three things that I'm working on really right now is, is you know, cultivating um, the leadership of, of our um, school improvement plans. I think ultimately it, it all comes down to being able to have you know, goals that are, are measurable and, and having good plans that support them and then supporting that really through continuous improvement process with, with, with structures in particular, you know, MTSS. So I think that that reigns uh, supreme throughout the course of the entire year. I also think understanding where we are in terms of college and career readiness is always going to be something that's going to be important to me um, at the secondary level and also at the uh, you know elementary level, kind of knowing yourself as a learner, you know, connecting, um, you know, a, a variety of different activities to the college and career readiness framework. And we're doing a, a number of things, you know, launching, launching that. Um, and I think the other piece that's important to me uh, is going to be personalized learning, um, you know, post pandemic. Um, is a huge opportunity for us to refine where we're at. Um, we uh, do tremendous work in, in that umbrella. And I use that term, you know, personalized learning to, to talk about, you know, maybe some you know, blended learning opportunities as well too. And sometimes you think about that just kind of in a flex model where, you know, you're here X amount of days and you're here, you know, X amount of days in person. But to me, it's also the opportunity for some rotational models, station models, flip classrooms, uh, playlist uh, type of models. And and really, ultimately, it comes down to: Can the teacher know what the kids need to know? Do they really know them? Do they really know their learners? The kids that are in front of them every day. Huge passion of mine. And then number two: Does the learner really know how they learn? And if we can put those things together and weave them together, we can be really, really good in the classroom for kids. A whole group instruction has its place and, and 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 there should be some whole group direct instruction from time to time. But I think more than anything, an opportunity for some targeted small group instruction is just the key and the game changer to, you know, really a, a great education for kids. So I love the fact that you brought up personalized learning. Do you think in 
five, 10 years, the model of education is going to change drastically to fit the mold of personalized learning? I think it really already has. I mean, think, think about, you know, wh where, where we're at right now. We, we, you know, we've looked at it from a device standpoint for some time. We've looked at it from an instructional model from some time. I and mean, we look at ed tech tools that we have and what's the rate of return that we, we, we have on, on those and where's the redundancies and, you know, th throughout, uh, you know, we're, we're always going to get better um, with personalized learning when we know who the learner is and we know what we want them to learn. And, and, you know, I don't want to oversimplify a very, very complex topic, but, you know, being able to understand what is it that we want our kids to know. And, you know, it's the first PLC question that has not gone out of style. There's no way to teach all the standards. It's impossible. So what is the most important thing? And then how or what strategies can we use for kids to demonstrate their knowledge where they have a good amount of choice and agency along the way is, is really just going to be um, that, that journey. And I think as we continue to take that journey together, you know, through kids choosing their own pathways, um, kids having opportunities to, uh, you know, grow and, and take different, take different pathways as along their way is really, really exciting. You know, I don't know what it's going to look like 10 years from now. Um, I, I absolutely still see, you know, brick and mortar schools, but I see, you know, more and more, you know, online learning. I see more and more opportunities for some blended learning, but let's not kid ourselves. The thing that we miss the most while we were not able to be together every day, we miss that relational piece. And we're suffering the consequences of that from a social emotional standpoint. I think that's the other piece that, you know, we, we talk about blended or personalized or college and career, social emotional. Um, we, we need to look at our social emotional. We need to look at our advisory. We need to talk about getting kids together in a, in, in a, in a circle um, and looking at restorative, you know, concepts for, for kids to be able to talk with one another, to resolve some conflict. Those are the things that we missed, yep. you know, and, and, uh, you know, we do a lot with, with, uh, you know, technology and ed tech, you know, platforms and one-to-one, -one, and that's great. But at the end of the day, our kids need to grow social emotionally, and we need to pick up some kids that, that, uh, fell behind that curve, not just academically and social emotionally. And I don't like the term learning loss, you know, at all, quite frankly, but, no. you know, it, it was what happened and, you know, no pointing fingers or blaming what's done is done. But from, from here on out, if this doesn't solidify the need for social emotional learning, not just in a standalone advisory, but a full integration throughout curriculum, I don't know what else will. I mean, we have a crisis in our country right now that at the student level and the adult level that, that needs to be addressed. So Brian, we're getting toward the end of our conversation and I love coming back to this one question. I asked it of all my guests. So for an aspiring or current leader, if there's something they could do tomorrow or next week to enhance their leadership skills, what would you advise them to do? Well, what I, I'm always going to tell people to build their professional learning network. You know, this is, it's critical that you don't do this on your own and your professional learning network should be the people within your building or within your district and then outside your district face-to-face -face and, and digitally. Um, the other type of thing too, and I, I know we live in a Google calendar type of world, but allowing yourself to have time for flexibility so that you're not booked, you know, that you don't have a 10, 11, a 12 and a one, uh, because then you need some reflection time. I, I would tell people to be conscious of their calendar so that they can give time to themselves to reflect on what they've learned and allow time for those organic conversations to occur that you're visible um, and available uh, for, for them. Brian, how can folks connect with you on social media? Sure. At Brian Swempke on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn, you know, welcome to, to engage in a conversation with me. Come hang out with you and I on Tuesday mornings is, is one of the better ways as well, too. We don't have all the answers. Um, I don't have all the answers. I have more questions than answers, even after 22, 23 years of doing this. Yep. Um, but, it, you know, we show up every day and we we, we do our very, very best, um, you know, to, to make things a little bit better each day. Well, the room is the smartest person, right? I mean, we, we don't That's have right. all the answers, but uh, we definitely like having people at the table. So definitely check out Mastermind every Tuesday morning. 
And again, you can find information on that and sign up at teachbetter.com slash mastermind. Brian, it is always a joy to speak with you, my friend, also to spend every Tuesday morning with you. And I'm just so fortunate not only to be connected with you, but also to have you on the Aspire to Lead podcast. Thank you so much for having me. All the best.